It's been 2,000 years since the glorious light of the cross illuminated a world veiled in darkness and confusion about the character of God. And still today, the greatest need of mankind is a revelation of God's love as revealed in the life of Christ. Amazing Facts presents the Everlasting Gospel with Pastor Doug Batchelor. Coming to you each week from Sacramento Central Church in sunny California. Discover hidden treasures in God's Word today. I'm glad to see each of you here. And I pray that, um, I pray that you will pray for me. Because I really feel like uh, we're treading on sacred ground in the theme that we've been talking about the last three or four weeks and uh, will still for a little time to come. I'm not sure how long uh, we'll go. There's so much material on this subject of Jesus throughout the Bible. And today we'll be dealing with the third in this series. Now this is just, we're just doing a quick overview. Um, last night I flew back from Watsonville. I was actually down at SoCal and so Rich Collenberg and I, we flew down, we did our presentations there and then after dark took off at Watsonville and flew up through the fog into the starlight, turned around over the ocean and began heading back to Sacramento. It's very interesting, it was cold there and had our jackets on. By the time you got to Sacramento we were sweating. But uh, flying at night it's easy to spot certain landmarks. You see these clusters of light and you could say, well, that's San Jose and, and uh, that over there, of course, was Watsonville and there you've got Stockton and Elk Grove and West Sac and you're able to see these clusters of light and identify them. There's a whole lot of city and community and neighborhoods in between that you can't always identify. In our series on Jesus through the Bible, we're doing a flyover and we're just looking at some of the high points. We talked about Joseph as a type of Christ. We talked about Moses last week as a wonderful type of Christ, but we did not cover everything. Matter of fact, after the sermon, I was stomping my foot and thinking, oh, one of those great examples of Jesus in the comparison with Moses. Moses was the meekest man, Christ meek and lowly. And I kept thinking of other things, oh, I wish I'd said this, I wish I'd said that. So I'm sort of issuing a disclaimer. This is not an exhaustive, comprehensive study. We're doing a flyover because I want you to realize how much of Jesus is really in the Bible and what a sacred document you have in your hands with the Bible. It is a supernatural book that proves the reality of God and one way we know that is because Christ was the fulfillment of all of these historical characters. I heard an amazing fact. Matter of fact, if you were listening to the broadcast last Sunday, you may have already heard this, but I'm just gambling that most of you weren't listening, so I'm going to share it again. Back about 11 years ago, there was a man named Stan Caffey and his wife, Linda. Well, they got married and as often happens when you combine households, they said, look, we got to make some space. And she said, you got to clean out this garage stand, which also served as his shop where he did some bicycle repair. And he had, you know, collected the typical stuff that often develops in a garage or even a shop. Among the things that uh, they were ferreting through, she said, look, uh, you got to get rid of that uh, picture you got on the wall. Well, he had bought 10 years earlier this uh, it was a duplicate of the Constitution of the United States and it was framed and hanging there. And uh, he said, oh, I like that. It's, a, it's kind of a historical document. document. And, and she said, you know, it's, it's just a cheap copy and it, it's got to go. And she won the argument. And so um, took it out of the frame, rolled it up to save some space and she piled it in the car with a lot of other things they donated to thrift store there in Nashville. Fast forward a year. Michael Sparks, who is a music engineer in the Nashville area, went to the gift store in his spare time. It was called Music City gift sto Thrift Store. And um, he was rummaging around. He found a pair of salt and pepper shakers and some candlesticks. And there was this rolled up copy of the Constitution. He looked at it and he said, what do you want for this? And the proprietor said, $2.75, which was 75 cents more 
than Stan Caffey had paid for it 11 years earlier. Well, when Michael Sparks got it back home and he unrolled it and went to pin it up on the wall and he looked at it and spent several days looking at it and he thought, you know, this looks like it could be pretty old even though it is just a copy. Got on the internet, started clicking around and did a little research and there were some clues and he discovered that he had one of only 36 remaining copies of the Declaration of Independence that had been commissioned by John Quincy Adams. 200 originals had been commissioned, but uh, they've only been able to find 36 intact, and he had number 37. So after it was authenticated, that took a year to authenticate it, and he had it carefully preserved in glass. They auctioned it there in South Carolina. Bidding began at $125,000. Bidding concluded at over $477,000. Now, how do you think Stan and Linda Caffey fell? <laughs> Wonder what happened to their marriage. <laughs> he actually said, well, you know, if, if I hadn't donated it to the thrift shop, it'd still be hanging up in my garage. <laughs> he didn't know what he had. And I wonder how many of us don't know what we've got. You have a sacred document in your hands in the Bible. And this series on Jesus throughout the Scripture, when we look at these characters in the Bible, it helps us to recognize, wow, how did God know? How could God have such complete control of history so that the lives of these great Bible characters that really did live could be replicated in the life of Jesus? You know, there's a quote from uh, the book, That I Might Know Him. This is that Christian book, That I Might Know Him. It's a what they call a devotional book, page 208. And it begins with the Scripture, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the Scriptures the things concerning himself. I've read that so far, I think, uh, during each presentation. There is one great central truth to be kept ever before the mind in searching the Scriptures. Christ and Him crucified. Every other truth is invested with influence and power correspo corresponding to its relation to this theme. Every other truth in the Bible has its power drawn from the truth that Jesus is the core, especially in the Old Testament as well. It is only in the light of the cross that we can discern the exalted character of the law of God. The soul, palsied by sin, can be endowed with life only through the work wrought out on the cross by the author of our salvation. The love of Christ constrains man to unite with him in his labors and sacrifice. The revelation of divine love awakens in them a sense of their neglected obligation to be light bearers to the world and inspires them with a missionary spirit. This truth, Christ in all the Bible, enlightens the mind and sanctifies the soul. It will banish unbelief and inspire faith. That's my goal. That's why I'm doing this. I want to banish unbelief and inspire faith in His Word in your hearts. When Christ in His work of redemption is seen to be the great central truth in the system of truth, a new light is shed upon the events of past and the future. They are seen in a new relation and possess a new and a deeper significance. The Old Testament is as verily the gospel in types and shadows as the New Testament is in unfolding power. Do you get that? The Old Testament is the gospel also. You first read about the New Testament in the Old Testament. You first hear the words of the New Covenant in Jeremiah, in Moses. The New Testament does not present a new religion. The Old Testament does not present a religion to be superseded by the new. The New Testament is only the advancement and unfolding of the old. Abel, that's going pretty far back in the Bible, Abel was a believer in Christ as verily saved by his power as was Peter and Paul. Enoch was a representative of Christ as surely was the beloved disciple John. 
That God who walked with Enoch was our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was the light of the world then just as he is now. The truth for this time is broad in its outlines, far-reaching, embracing many doctrines. But these doctrines are not detached items which mean little. They are united by golden threads forming a complete whole with Christ as the living center. All the Bible is about Jesus. We've looked at Christ and seen different facets of Christ's character by looking at Enoch and Abel and Adam and Noah and Joseph and Moses and today David. Now this is doubly important today because of all the characters mentioned in the holy writings you find this name mentioned more than any name. David is mentioned more than our Lord Jesus. David is mentioned more than Moses, more than Elijah, more than Joseph. There's more than one John in the Bible. There's actually more than one Moses. There's more than one Jesus mentioned in the Bible. But there's only one individual in the whole Bible called by the name David. David is one of the most outstanding types of Jesus in the Bible. Now I'm not saving David for the third presentation because of importance. I'm going through these types of Christ sequentially and now we reach really David. David is found 1,066 times in the Bible. There's more said about him than any other Bible character. In many ways this book could be the story of David. Jesus is the son of David. Did you know that the last chapter in the Bible talks about David? You can read there in Revelation where Christ is the root and the offspring of David in Revelation chapter 22. So let's look at some of the parallels that we're going to find in the Bi Bible about David. David means beloved. Jesus is the beloved son of the Father, called sometimes the only begotten son. You remember when Jesus was baptized, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so that's what the very name David means. And David was beautiful. 1 Samuel 16, 12, so he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy. That means he was, had been out in the sun and because he'd been watching the sheep. Ruddy means red. You know, you can look at someone when they've been out working in the garden, you say, you've been out in the sun. He was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. You know, it doesn't say that about too many people in the Bible, that they were handsome. It says it about Joseph, another type of Christ. It says it about David. Of course, it says it about the wives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It doesn't say Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob were good looking. But it says all of their wives were good looking because they are all types of the church. And David who a type, is a type of Christ is also called beloved. By the way, in the, word, in the book Song of Solomon, which is really a beautiful metaphor of Jesus, it speaks of the, uh, the bridegroom as the beloved is mine and I am his. You probably sung that song before. You know which one? He is mine and I am his. His manner over me is love. How many of you know that one? Let's all sing it together. No, I'm just. <laughs> He's born in Bethlehem. Now, Jesus is born in Bethlehem, of course. 1 Samuel 16, 1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I provided myself a king among his sons. And again, Jesus came from Bethlehem. Even though he was growing up in Nazareth, God orchestrated history where he was born in Bethlehem. You also find that David is the youngest son of an ancient father. Now, you'll find that's often true of the types in the Bible. Abraham was very old when Isaac was born. Isaac is a type of Christ. He was way beyond when he should have had him. He was an ancient father who gave birth. Joseph, rather Jacob, kept trying to have a son through Rachel, but she was barren. Finally, he has the son Joseph, and Joseph is referred to as the son of his old age. 
And then you find that's also true with David. You can read here in 1 Samuel 17, verse 12, Now David was the son of that Ephraimite of Bethlehem of Judah, whose name was Jesse. He had eight sons, and the man was old and advanced in years in the days of Saul. Jesse was an old man. David was the son of his old age. Because our father is the ancient of days. His son is brought before him in Daniel chapter 7. The son, one like the son of man, comes before the ancient of days, the eternal. And so he's even a type of David in this part of the story as well. As we dig into the story, now there's a lot to cover, so I'm kind of jumping from one to the next. As we dig into the story, we find out that David is a good shepherd. Jesus is our good shepherd. Even beyond that, David is a sacrificial shepherd. You can read in 1 Samuel 17 when he's telling King Saul he's about to fight Goliath. David said to Saul, verse 34, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it, and I struck it, and delivered the lamb from its mouth. That reminds us, of course, of Jesus, who is our good shepherd, who goes out and takes us. You ever heard about someone snatched from the jaws of the lion? Uh, the devil goes around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he might devour. Jesus is our good sacrificial shepherd who snatches us from the jaws of the lion. Sometimes you think you're going to be the lion's lunch, and Jesus can save you because he's a good shepherd. Now, I hope I'm a better pastor than I am a shepherd. Uh, I actually did a little shepherding, but I wasn't a very good shepherd. I've had both sheep and goats. I have sheep and goats here at the church, too. But, uh, I mean, I actually, I worked with the Navajos. <laughs> when I was in New Mexico, my uncle uh, had a trading post out on the reservation, and the Navajos were principally shepherds. And uh, they would walk around and shepherd their sheep. I like to herd them with the motorcycle, but that tend to make them very nervous. And I, I try and help them round up the sheep with a motorcycle. And, and they, I think half of them died from stress when I got done with a sheep roundup. But uh, I, I also had goats. When first moved up to Covalo, uh, had two or three goats at one time. Used to milk them every day. And uh, it's kind of nice when you have fresh goat milk in your cereal. I was a little bit primitive back then. The goats actually hopped up into the house and we milked them there, but our house wasn't much and so you'd understand if you saw it. But I remember I used to have three or four goats and then one day one of them disappeared and I didn't know what was going on. A few weeks later another one disappeared and I thought must have wandered off and joined another herd. I wasn't very smart. I grew up in New York City. I wasn't a very good shepherd. And then one night I was sleeping and the goats used to sleep under the house. And I heard bang, big bang. It sounded like the house had been hit by a wrecking ball. Whole house shook. I jumped up and then I heard the goat. This was our goat Libby. And she was bleating. Just distressed terribly. And it was getting further away, and I realized goats don't wander around and forage at night. I thought a mountain lion had her. And I later found out it was a bear. Now, I had a 22 out behind the seat in the pickup truck because the kids were little and I didn't want them to get to it. And I heard the goat, 80 pound goat, being carried up the hill pleading. And I felt terrible because I thought, I want to save her, but I don't want to die. <laughs> and I'm not going to go out there and shoot a mountain lion or a bear and try and take away its food with a 22. Because if you know anything about bears, you hit them with a 22, it's like, you know, a BB gun. It just makes them mad. <laughs> and so whenever I hear this story about David going out after a bear that took the sheep, I think, boy, he really was a good shepherd or he was crazy. <laughs> because 
He had a lot of sheep. I wasn't going to lay my life down for my last goat. <laughs> and you know, the way I usually manage to soothe my conscience with this is because, after all, it was a goat. And you know, the goats are lost and the sheep are saved. <laughs> if it was a sheep, who knows? Maybe I would have gone. <laughs> but uh, now we keep the gun in the house. Just last week, neighbor called. This week, neighbor called, Doug, it's all bear. I said, was it in the house or was it out in the meadow? Oh, it was out in the meadow because we've had bears try and break into our house up here. I read this story and it says he killed the bear. He didn't even have a 22. It doesn't even say he used the sling. You read on, it says he took it by the beard. Now, lions have a beard, but I've never seen a bear's beard. But he got a hold of it somehow and the same way the Spirit of the Lord came on Samson, he had supernatural strength. God did that for David. And he laid his life on the line to save the sheep. So he was a sacrificial, loving shepherd like our Jesus. Aren't you glad that Jesus is a good shepherd? Most of you just lost confidence in me as a shepherd, didn't you? <laughs> as long as you're not goats, you're okay. They were both anointed. Both David and Jesus were anointed. The word Christ... Christos means anointed in Greek. Messiah means anointed in Hebrew. David was anointed. That's when he first appears he's anointed by Samuel. And he was the youngest of the brethren that were anointed. Samuel was hesitant at first. You remember John the Baptist, when he baptized Jesus, he said, no, you need to baptize me. But uh, he said, let it be so for now. 1 Samuel 16, 13, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came on David from that day forward. David begins his ministry after his anointing. When does Christ begin his ministry? At his baptism, the Holy Spirit comes down upon him. And then he begins to teach and to preach. After Jesus is anointed, he fights with the devil in the wilderness. After David is anointed, he fights with a giant in the wilderness. And we'll get to that in just a minute. There's battle is going on now between the Israelites and the Philistines. You see, Jesse sends David to care for his brothers that are in the battle, sent by the father to seek his brethren. You remember, Joseph is sent by the father to seek his brethren. 1 Samuel 17, 17, Then Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of dried grain and these ten loaves and run to your brothers at the camp. See how your brothers are doing and bring back some assurance from them. And so here, David is sent from the ancient father seeking the welfare of the brothers and he sends provisions, he sends bread. Jesus comes from the father to us and he brings bread, doesn't he? But when he gets there to care for his brothers, do his brothers say, oh, David, we love you. That's so good. Thank you so much. Do they receive him joyfully or do they misunderstand his mission? When Joseph came, did his brothers understand his mission or did they receive him in uh, a negative way? First Samuel, so David is also misunderstood by his brothers. First Samuel 17, verse 28. Now Eliab, the oldest of the brothers, heard when David spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? Accusing him of being a bad shepherd. I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you've come down to see the battle. It just totally misunderstood the heart and the mission of his brother. He came seeking his welfare. Was Jesus misunderstood by his brothers? John, I'm talking about not only his own people, but even his own family. Jesus had four, at least half-brothers. John 7, verse 4 and 5. And they said to Jesus, Nobody does anything in secret why he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Not at first, but they later believed. Did David's brothers later believe? They did. Matter of fact, they became part of his mighty men or his army. And then, of course, there's that great story of David, and I wish I could spend more time on this, 
where David sees Goliath down there, who for 40 days comes out in the wilderness and defies the armies of God. After the anointing of Jesus, does he go out into the wilderness for 40 days? Does he have a battle with the devil? Biggest giant of all, the giant of evil. And what is it that Jesus uses to bring down the giant? A stone. The Word of God is the rock. That's the rock that brings down that image in Daniel chapter 2. Christ is the Word. Are we right? Are we all on the same page? The Word is a rock. The Ten Commandments are written on stone. And that's what's used to bring down the giant. And so he has this battle with the giant. Jesus meets every temptation and he says, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord God, and him only shall you serve. 1 Samuel 17, 50. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. And he struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head. So he was initially knocked out with a rock. He's unconscious. But he dispatches him permanently with his own sword. What is the sword biblically? The Word of God, Hebrews chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 6, is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So stone is the Word of God, sword is the Word of God, David defeats the giant with the Word of God. How do we defeat the giant, the devil? A mighty fortress is our God. You sung that song. One little word will fell him. The Word of God brings him down. Isn't it interesting? He takes Goliath's own sword to destroy him. The cross that the devil used to kill Jesus is the weapon that destroys the devil. In crucifying Christ on the cross, the devil said, we're going to use this cross to kill him. Jesus takes a cross and he uses it like a sword to kill the devil. That's what ends up defeating him. Goliath is killed by his own sword. Satan's cross kills Satan. And then, you know, I love this part of the story. After David kills the giant, you realize you've got to have this mental picture here. You've got the Valley of Elah. You've got all the army of the Philistines are gathered on one mountainside watching their champion. And you've got all the Israelites. They're very apprehensive. And someone was probably taking bets over there on the side of Israel about is this whippersnapper that's going down there, is he going to be able to take the giant? And they probably had pretty big odds going that David was about to get squashed. Matter of fact, they probably had 100 to 1 odds in favor of the shepherd against the giant. They didn't have a lot of confidence. And then all of a sudden they see David run towards the giant. They maybe can't hear all the conversation going on between Goliath and David. But they see David, he throws down his staff and he runs towards the giant and he snaps a stone. The giant rocks, wobbles, thunders to the ground. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. David runs up to him without any hesitation. The armor bearer for the giant, he runs. Remember, see, Goliath comes out with all this pomp. He's got an armor bearer holding his shield. When the armor bearer sees Goliath go down, he probably drops the shield and runs for his life. David then takes the sword of the giant, which is as long as David, and chops off his head. Now the Israelite soldiers and David's brothers who had been watching this thinking, oh, this is going to be bad. This is going to look off. This is going to be ugly. Oh, he's going to, poor shepherd, why'd Saul send him out there? All of a sudden their whole disposition changes. They shout for joy and they say, we won! You notice what happens? David's victory becomes their victory. They take credit for his victory. And they are then rallied. Notice, they don't just stand there and say, we won. They then in, get involved in the battle and they start to chase the Philistines now. And they have a great victory. So, this is very practical for you and me. How do you and I enjoy the victory of Christ over the devil? When we see 
just like the Israelites saw, that Jesus did win. He defeated the devil. Christ rose. He said, it is finished. He said, all hail. He's won. The devil's doom is sealed. But even though Goliath was dead, were the soldiers, the Philistines, still on the hill? We claim that victory, and then we need to take up the battle with David. David then led them against the Philistines. And so we join him in that battle. So this is a wonderful analogy where Christ is a type of David, or David is a type of Christ, and you say, the victory of David became the victory of the Israelites. The victory of Christ becomes our victory. And we can say, praise the Lord, we won. And then you follow your captain into battle. You don't just stand there. When Jesus overcame, we become overcomers. David stripped the enemy of his armor. 1 Samuel 17, verse 54, David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem and he put his armor in his tent. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus stripped the armor from the devil. Luke 11, verse 20, But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace and his goods, they're at peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. This is what David did with Goliath. This is what Jesus did with the devil. You and I were captives of the devil. He liberates us. He takes away the devil's armor. Before Christ came, man has no power to resist the devil. But there's a crack in the devil's armor because of Christ. You remember when the arrow found the crack in Ahab's armor? It was the prophecy of Micaiah, the Word of God. That's what found the crack in the armor. Jesus takes away the devil's armor. He is defenseless. You and I can have a victory over him. After David wins that battle for a little while, he follows Saul, and pretty soon Saul becomes demon-possessed and jealous, and David, he tries to pin David to the wall a few times. He's not accepted by his own people because of jealousy. And he basically has to work as an exile. Jesus had to work as an exile from Jerusalem because of the jealousy of the priests. Even Pilate knew that he had been handed over because of jealousy. When Saul heard the people sing, Saul has killed his thousands, and David is ten thousands. He heard the women singing that. They were the cheerleaders when they came back from battle. Saul began to brood with jealousy, even though he should have rejoiced and said, you know, praise the Lord. I'm glad that uh, you've been called by God and that He's blessing you and that we've got the victory because of you. He was jealous. When the people began to follow Jesus instead of the scribes and the lawyers and the Pharisees, they were jealous. Jesus basically had to work outside with the poor. Got persecuted in one city, He went to another. He lived like an exile from Jerusalem because of jealousy. David was a king in exile. 1 Samuel 22, verse 1, verse 2, David left Gath and he escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's house heard about it, they went down to him there. And then I like this. This is a beautiful illustration of how David is a type of Christ. I've shared this with you before, but I'm trusting you forgot. All those who were in distress or in debt, or discontented. How'd you like to raise up a church and say, all right, we're advertising, let's see if we can assemble all those who are in debt, all those who are distressed, all those who are discontented, and let's build up a church. Would you try to market your church to that kind of a motley crew? Who was it that gathered around David? There's all these people who are sort of the outcasts of society. But you know what? After following David, it then says they were the mighty men. They went from being this motley crew of people that had bill collectors following them around and calling them up all the time, and they were just unhappy with the government. They're discontented, and, and they don't like the way things are going. And all of a sudden, he becomes a captain over them, kind of like Robin Hood and the... the men that lived out there in the woods, Sherwood Forest. He became their leader. About 400 men were with him. 
What is the church composed of? Have you read what Paul said? 1 Corinthians 1 verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise, according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. And God has chosen the base things of the world and the things that are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to pass the things that are. I mean, think about David. Samuel goes to pick a king and he looks at the tall, dark, handsome brothers of David and he says, wow, he looks like he's king material. Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. Jesse, get your sons. One of them is going to be anointed. So Jesse gets the seven good-looking ones and he leaves the daydreamer, David, sunburned, got bright eyes, but, you yeah, know, he's not as big as Eliab. He's not as broad-shouldered as maybe some of the other brothers. He's a poet out there slinging, slinging his sling and playing on his harp and let's leave David out where he is. We'll bring the other boys. Which one does God choose? The one you'd never think would succeed. Isn't that how God operates? Walks by, sees these fishermen. There's this one bombastic, loud mouth fisherman named Peter always telling the biggest stories. He says, follow me, I'll make you a fisher of men. Is that where you, why don't you go to the seminary to get your preachers up in Jerusalem? Why would you go to a fishing village in Capernaum? Now I say this not to be disparaging of preachers that go to seminary. I say this to encourage you that He can use you. Don't think, oh, you know, I'm in debt or I'm not qualified. If you follow Jesus and make him your captain, look at what Jesus did with that motley crew. He built a kingdom. They became his mighty men. They were part of his cabinet. Look at what Jesus did with the 12 apostles. Turned the world upside down. Overthrew paganism in the Roman Empire. Displaced it with Christianity. With those, there were a few educated. That's why Paul said not many. Paul was educated. There were a few, but not many. God's often chosen the foolish things. As you study the life of David, you see that like Jesus, he took attention and time to care for his parents. When he realized that he had a price on his head, that King Saul was going to hunt him everywhere in the land of Israel, he knew that soon Saul was going to go after his parents. After all, King Saul killed a whole village of priests just because of David. He thought, my family's not safe. 1 Samuel 22, verse 3, Then David went from there to Mizpah of Moab. Don't forget, David had a great-grandmother that was a Moabitess. Her name was Ruth. She's in the Bible. Jesse was related to Ruth. And so the Moabites sort of, you know, they took him in. And uh, David sent his father and his mother, whose father's now getting old, he said, you go stay with the king of Moab. You'll be safe there. You won't be safe in Israel. David continued to kind of hang around in Israel, but he wanted to make sure that his parents were cared for. What was one of the final things that Jesus did on the cross? Did he care for his mother? He said to John, the apostle, he said, son, behold your mother. Woman, behold your son. Meaning, take my mom into your house. Watch out for her. Take care of her. They threatened to stone Jesus and they threatened to stone David. Now I read this to you last week because they also did that with Moses. Remember they took up stones two occasions to stone their Messiah, Jesus. 1 Samuel 30 verse uh, 6. It's, this all happens when David comes back from fighting the Philistines their family, all the families of the mighty men that had been following him are attacked by the Amalekites and they're all carried away. And they're all so broken hearted. They've all lost their wives and their children that had been left behind. Now they're blaming David. They said, look, we followed you from place to place and you had this bright idea that we'd go out and fight with the Philistines and Philistines told us we weren't good enough to fight and we come back and now our families are gone. They're all discouraged. They're broken hearted and they're ready to stone David. Just like Jesus. Stone their leader as soon as something goes wrong. Another characteristic that you see in the life of David that is very much like Jesus 
David was very kind to his enemies. First of all, King Saul wanted to kill him. And when David had opportunity to kill Saul, it says in 1 Samuel 26, David said to Abishai, who wanted to chop off Saul's head, Do not destroy him. Who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? Luke 9, 55 and 56. Jesus turned and rebuked James and John when they wanted to bring fire down from heaven on some people that were unkind, some Samaritans that were unkind to Jesus. And he said, You don't know what manner of spirit you are of. The Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives. Some of you remember when David was fleeing from uh, Absalom that the Benjamite by the name of Shimei was out there cursing David and throwing stones. And Abishai said, Let me go cut off the head of this dead dog. And David said, Let him curse. He turned the other cheek. David had that meekness of Christ, that forgiveness of Christ. Even when his own son was trying to kill him, David said, Deal gently with a young man, even with Absalom, for my sake. David showed when Abner had joined Saul in trying to kill David, David forgave Abner. When Amasa had joined Absalom in trying to kill David, after the battle, David said, I'm willing to forgive you. He was extremely merciful and forgiving. But David could also be a pretty fierce judge when somebody was uh, involved in high-handed guilt. When somebody began to brag that they killed King Saul, David said, Were you not afraid to lift up your hand against the Lord's anointed? And he told one of his soldiers, Kill him. Execute him. By his own admission, he killed the king. And so, uh, you know, he could also be a judge in that respect and, and uh, be pretty fierce. He began his work, his life work, at the age of 30. David came to the throne at 30 years of age. You read that in 2 Samuel 5 verse 4, David was 30 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 40 years. It's interesting, Jesus began his ministry at age 30. You find that in Luke 3.23. And it was 40 years after Christ began His ministry, Jerusalem was destroyed. Why do they do that? Numbers chapter 4 verse 3, there was a law in the Old Testament of Moses, from 30 years old and above, even to 50 years, all who enter the service to do the work in the tabernacle. You could not serve as a priest until you were at least 30. You weren't really considered a man until you were about 30 years of age. You were still considered a youth. By the way, when David killed Goliath, uh, he wasn't 30 years old yet, but he wasn't a 10-year-old. He was still probably in his early 20s. He's a young man then. So when you look at these comparisons, you see David was a prophet. Jesus is a prophet. David was a king. Was Jesus a king? Is Jesus a king? David was a judge. Jesus is a judge. David was despised and rejected, but he finally became king. Jesus was despised and rejected, but he finally became king. David was a captain, as was Jesus. David never lost a battle. Jesus never lost a battle. Isn't it good to know that you can fight side by side with Jesus and not lose a battle? And you know, there's so many stories I could tell you. How many of you remember the story of David's mighty men? Read through some of those. But one in particular, David had a mighty man by the name of Eliezer. And they're battling with the Philistines. And the Philistines had outnumbered them, and the battleground was this barley field. And even David's mighty men and the other soldiers were retreating because they saw that they were losing ground. They thought, we better retreat to a better position. And everybody retreated except David and Eliezer. And they stationed themselves on this hill in this barley field, and they fought back to back. And it says, they ended up, I mean, I really would love to see uh, a YouTube video of that battle of David and Eliezer fighting back to back against the Philistines, whipping their swords around like a harvesting scythe, mowing down the Philistines. You know what it says? The Lord wrought a great victory that day through the, just the two of them. As long as you stuck, Eliezer said, look, everyone's retreating, but David's still here. I'm not leaving my king. And it goes on to say in that story, by the way, his name is Eliezer, the son of Dodo, so he should be easy to find in the Bible. And that kind of faith is sort of extinct also. But it says he claved to his sword, his hand claved to his sword. What is a sword? 
the Word of God. He saw everybody fled and left David, but he said, I'm not going to leave David. If you stick with David, you won't lose. You and Jesus, your son of David, are always a majority. You don't have to be afraid. He never lost a battle. So when you're tempted, when you're attacked by the devil, if you just stick with Jesus, you will not lose. <laughs> hang on to your sword, hang on to Jesus, and you can take on a whole army of Philistines and be victorious. The Bible says that the people of David were his body. Jesus tells us that we are his body. You read about this in 1 Chronicles 11 verse 1. Then all Israel came together to David at Hebron, saying, Indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. You know, Jesus even used those words when he rose. He said, Feel me, a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone as you see that I have. And uh, Christ says, Now we are, actually Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 27, Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. The people of Israel said to David, We are your body. The church says to Christ, We are your body. Same language. Now, as you move on, and there's a lot more. Like I said, this is a flyover. You ought to do your own study. Hey, do me a favor. I'm lengthening my list. Some people came to me during the week and they say, hey, Pastor Doug, you left out some points. And I've added them to my notes because I might do this again someday. So if you find other analogies and parallels between David and Jesus, I hope you'll share them with me. David is then betrayed by a dear friend and when the betrayal doesn't work out the way he expected, he hangs himself. Is Jesus betrayed by a close friend when it backfires? You know, so Judas didn't think that Christ would be killed. Judas thought that Jesus would perform another miracle, deliver himself, and he was going to force Christ into the throne of Israel. And then he could be treasurer and everyone would give him credit. And that's why when he was in the temple and he saw that they were going to execute him and Christ was doing nothing to save himself, he went and he threw the money down. He said, I betrayed innocent blood. And he went out and hung himself. But isn't it interesting that both were betrayed by a close friend in Jerusalem, the betrayal backfires, and they hang themselves. Ahithophel was the counselor and friend of David who betrayed him uh, and went with the rebellion of Absalom. After David saw that his son was rebelling, he went and he crossed the Kidron Valley after Jesus was betrayed, he went and crossed the Kidron Valley. 2 Samuel 15 verse 23, All the country wept with a loud voice, and all the people crossed over, and the king himself crossed over the book Kidron, and the people crossed over towards the way of the wilderness. Those who still followed Jesus crossed over with him. Those who followed David crossed the Kidron with him. By the Kidron, by the way, the Kidron is where the blood ran during the Passover. And so when Christ crossed the Kidron during the Passover, when he died, he crossed over the blood. He passed over the blood. John 18, when Jesus spoke these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron. And there was a garden where his disciples went. Did Jesus weep in that garden on the Mount of Olives in the Kidron? Christ did also weep on the Mount of Olives. In the garden there, Jesus expresses a willingness to die for his um, people. He says you know, he has a willingness to do God's will. Jesus says, not my will, yours be done. Listen to what David says when he prays in the garden. He says, Lord, if you have no delight in me, by the way, this is 2 Samuel 15, 26. If you have no delight in me, here I am. Let him do to me as seems good to him. David was totally surrendered to the will of God then when uh, Absalom rebelled. And that's another way in which he is like them. Jesus weeps on the Mount of Olives over Jerusalem. Does everyone remember that verse? Luke 19, 37. Now as he approached and he neared the descent of the Mount of Olives, when he approached he saw the city and he wept over it. 2 Samuel 15, King David. He went up by the ascent of the Mount of Olives he wept as he went up, having his head covered and barefoot. All these parallels that you find. David was willing to die for his children. When Absalom is slain in the battle, you know the story, big battle when Absalom gathers the army together, 
and David and his mighty men are divided in three groups and they go out against Absalom. You get to uh, Revelation and you find that God the Father, Son, and Spirit take on the threefold entity of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. This great battle happens in Israel. And in the battle, both groups claim to serve Jehovah. In the last days, will both groups claim to be Christian? You'll have the beast in his image, and it's a counterfeit for God and his people that have his seal. This is great battle that takes place. Beautiful Absalom, who once lived in the palace, and the son of David, Lucifer, beautiful from the crown of his head to the sole of his foot, rebels against his creator without cause and leads the angels in a rebellion. And that, there's going to be a showdown at Armageddon between the devil and his angels and the humans that follow Satan and Christ and his army. That battle that took place that day with, uh, on the land of Israel is a parallel for that final battle. Who wins that battle? David's forces. Does David rejoice when everybody's slain, when the enemy is slain, when Absalom is slain, or does he weep? You know, there'll come a day when it's going to be a tragedy when we see all those that are slain. God wipes the tears from our eyes in Revelation 21 after what, the 1,000 years. There may be some initial sadness if we get to the kingdom and see there are people there, there are people that are missing that we didn't think would be there. Some of us might weep when we see people there we hope won't be there. But, uh, I, oh no, not them, Lord. <laughs> They'll ruin everything. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> But uh, we're going we're gonna to see some sadness when we see some people missing. David wept. Now listen to the prayer of David when he weeps over his lost son. 1 Samuel 18, The king was deeply moved, and he went up over his chamber, over the gate, and he wept. And as he went, he said thus, he's wailing and weeping, Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, if only I had died in your place, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Is Jesus willing to die in the place of his rebellious children and take our place? He's saying, I am willing to perish that you might not perish. David had that heart of God. You know, that's why the Bible says, in spite of the mistakes that David made, David was forgiven. Matter of fact, it's, it's an interesting verse that you find 1 Kings 14, 8. Did David sin? Did David, I mean, you know, it tells about David and Bathsheba. It tells about David bringing the ark up inappropriately and someone died because of that. It tells about David numbering Israel. David made mistakes. Probably several. He lied and pretended he was crazy. He's drooling on his beard and foaming at the mouth and acting crazy. He wasn't crazy. Crazy like a fox, as they say. And so David had his problems. But listen how God looks at David. 1 Kings 14, 8. And yet you have not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments, who followed me with all his heart to do only what was right in my eyes. Had God forgiven all of David's sins because of his, his sacrifice? And he looked upon David. He says, I only see that David did good because David ended well. You may fall along the way in the race and you may even have a bad start, but you want to have a good finish. Amen. And so God looked upon David and the record that God gives about David, he says, he followed me with all his heart. The reason that God could say David was a king after my heart is because David had a sacrificial love. David is a wonderful type of Jesus in the Bible. How often do you find somebody with such a complex character who in one vignette you see David, he's on a hill there with his sheep, he's strumming his harp and he's being poetic and melancholy. And next you see him, he's on the battlefield, he's got this oversized sword, he's hacking off a giant's head. Those pictures don't usually go together in our minds about the same person doing those things, right? David is a very complex character in that he was a poet, he was a shepherd, he's a king, he's a judge, he's a builder, he's an administrator, he's a dreamer, he was a romantic, and then all that David, very complex, but they're all giving different sides of our Jesus, the son of David. You know, I think this is beautiful that he was willing to die 
for his children. Now, here's the part that I don't want you to miss. David left Jerusalem because there was a rebellion. And when this battle of Armageddon is fought, so to speak, David then comes back as king. He was a king that was basically rejected, but a king that comes back. Is our King David coming back? Our King Jesus coming back? The son of David? And when he came back, he rewarded those who had supported him when he was rejected. There are some who stayed behind in Jerusalem when David fled because he was rejected. When the, when the nation was kidnapped, some stayed behind that remained loyal to him. They were the minority. And some who turned on him when it was convenient, when he came back, he rewarded those who were loyal. He judged those who had been unfaithful. Our son of David is coming back and uh, he's going to bring the new Jerusalem when he comes. You know, friends, as I go through these stories, I keep thinking about that verse in Hebrews 32. As we look at the types of Jesus through all the Bible, I keep wanting to say, and what shall I more say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and all the prophets. These are all types of Christ in the Bible. You know, you get all these different pictures of what Christ is like because he's reflected. I can see what you look like directly or I can look at a mirror and see what you look like. And you are seeing mirrors of Jesus all through the Bible. And so that's why we're spending time on this theme so we might know more about him because if you know him better, you'll love him better. If you love him better, you'll serve him better. Amen? If you've missed any of our Amazing Facts programs, visit our website at AmazingFacts.org. There you'll find an archive of all our television and radio programs, including Amazing Facts Presents. One location, so many possibilities. AmazingFacts.org. Journey back through time to the center of the universe. Discover how a perfect angel transformed into Satan, the arch-villain, the birth of evil, a rebellion in heaven, a mutiny that moved to earth. Behold the creation of a beautiful new planet and the first humans. Witness the temptation in evil. Discover God's amazing plan to save his children. This is a story that involves every life on earth. Every life. The Cosmic Conflict. If God is good, if God is all-powerful, if God is love, then what went wrong? Available now on DVD 